You want to talk about the biography? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the biography of DX, I wasn't sure how I'd like the concept of a biography on a group instead of an individual. They've been doing such good uh, biographies lately on the one person where they trace their, you know, even us experts don't know everything about this guy's childhood, early life, how they got in wrestling, whatever. And I thought, well, how are they going to have time to do all of this, you know, with this amount of people? They did it on a more abridged basis, but, you know, still they got it in. But I had mixed feelings about this show, too, because I really, the whole DX thing, when it was happening and I was having to be there and actually put up with it, I hated it. The childishness, the suck it, the crotch chop, and the ass showing. I never understood why pe people said in some of the talking heads in this, well, it was badass and it was they were cool. I'd, oh, only if you were in sixth grade. I never understood what was cool and bad. Cool and badass to me was... Stone Cold Steve Austin was The Undertaker, was The Rock's fucking incredible ego and glibness on the microphone, or, you know, what, cool nature boy Ric Flair with the styling and profiling, but grabbing your dick, telling everybody to suck it, pulling your tights down, I never, you know, and making fun of, in a lot of cases, the wrestling business. I never got that part. However... I did remember also that I kind of did like the second version of DX better than the first because it had Road Dogg and Billy Gunn in it and no Shawn Michaels. So possibly part of my feeling is personal also because Michaels was the instigator of all of this. But that's one of the things, though. They almost pretend like DX is just one big thing now, but it was Michaels with Hunter and China, and then it was everything else. It wasn't like there was a big DX with everyone. And as we talked about recently, Michaels had go away heat from the fans, whether people want to realize it or recognize it or talk about it now or not. And DX didn't really pick up steam as a thing until Sean Waltman came back. Yeah, because that was one of the, at the time, one of the more shocking reverse comebacks. Um, it, it had been all, all one way for a while there with people, former WWF people going to WCW. But then. And of course, as Sean admitted, he got fired and in WCW and they got the chance to bring him back. And that made a splash because the Monday Night War had really started heating up a bit. And suddenly we, you know, we got one back. So that was that was a thing that shocked people. And then let's face it, Road Dogg and Billy, neither one of them was Michaels in the ring, but they had more fresh, likable personality instead of that same pissy fucking look on Michaels' face, and it started getting over with people. And and Road Dog especially could talk his ass off because he's an Armstrong and he had a line of fucking bullshit. Again, one of the important things that has to be said when you're talking about why this got over, why grown men acting like children crotching uh crotching their chops. Cr crotching chopping, their chops. Chopping their crotches got over, you know, you do have to also say it was the time. It, you know, Russo worked in that moment with all of his ideas thrown at Vince because it was the time of that kind of crash TV and Jerry Springer and fucking Limp Biscuit was a big band right after this. Like, it was the time of all this crap. It worked then. It may not have worked. It certainly wouldn't have worked at any time before then. It may not have worked the same way afterwards. It was the right time for that, but DX was not a main event act at that time. Yeah, well, and they made that point in this program that it was the that period of the 90s where everybody would suddenly just lost their fucking minds and just wanted to, you know, drool all over everything. But at the same time, and also, who is this David Shoemaker? And why is he supposed to be an expert? And why does he try to, to sound like one when he obviously is, he knows a lot of good words. But has he ever actually been involved in the wrestling business anywhere, ever, ever? He's apparently been on some podcast, and he's aligned with Ben Simmons, who's the guy who has done good work for ESPN and also did that Andre the Giant documentary with a lot of historically inaccurate information, including featuring David Shoemaker. <laughs> I just find it amazing because I know a little bit about wrestling, and I happen to be okay at talking about it. But to know nothing about wrestling and then decide, I need to talk to the world about it. 
That's amazing. I don't know how you do that. He confidently says shit that's inaccurate. In a brilliant fashion. Yeah. I, have to yeah, I know he, he knows a lot of good words and he is absolutely confident that all the fucking prepared <laughs> dreck that he is delivering is. Um, and, you know, and he said, well, wrestling was boring and that. Well, no, the WWF was boring. Wrestling wasn't boring. The WWF was boring at that period of time and wrestling didn't need to change. The WWF did. But the. The change I thought was necessary was the change to Austin Rock, Taker, Foley, even a Triple H game, but not jacking off figuratively and literally. So um, Triple H got the first childhood bio, fascinated with wrestling, looked very weird as a teenage bodybuilder, not at all like what he would uh, morph into. He went from Killer Kowalski school to... <laughs> The WCW run was a mention where they said, well, we saw you at a tryout. He'd already signed with WCW. We said, call us when your contract's up. And then we skip ahead to he's there. And Sean's childhood bio. And he was a childhood fan, wanted to be a wrestler from the time he was a kid. And, of course, they this was fast forward in terms of, you know, childhood biographies. So they... Jumped him into the wrestling business pretty quick. Very little mention of, of Jose at all, Jose Lothario. Then suddenly he's in the Rockers, and they're partying every night. And then he splits from Marty and becomes the heartbreak kid. And that was covered very, fairly succinctly, but they never mentioned Sherry Martell's name. She was on a lot of the video with Sean. That was another, it, like... With Triple H in China, what, five, six, seven years later, Sean, he had Sherry, who was so animated, had such personality, it, it added to his presentation. It made the picture. The Undertaker admits that he didn't like Shawn Michaels, but he was a great worker. That's probably the most complimentary thing I've ever heard the Undertaker say about Shawn on, in public. And the click then gets formed where Shoemaker, again, says the click thought wrestling in the 90s was lame. Well, they probably did, because I think you're fucking lame, boot black or <laughs> cobble pot or whatever your fucking name is. <laughs> but they did make fun of Vince's 1990s occupation fetish with the plumber and the IRS guy and the fucking... Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Waltman had the best line. How come these people need a second occupation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wrestling's doing, because wrestling was doing bad at the time, partially because of all these guys with occupations. And yes, they're making the point, wrestling should have been made more adult. Yes, it should have. It should have been made more adult. Wrestling was always more adult than that foolishness, that Vince cartoon land. But don't make it more adult by making it more childish. Anyway, they showed the curtain call video and actually talked to the guy who shot it. Uh, Brian, I, you weren't there, were you? No, I did not go to that show. That was you would you would have been a well you would have been a young teenager, but I would have been a teenager who was traveling all over the Northeast going to shows, and I decided not to go to that one. Yeah. But they said the garden went ballistic. The garden didn't go ballistic. The garden cheered the individual people coming out and or reacted to in the case of the heels because they were stars coming out and what's going on. But then they sat there. I watched it from the fucking back standing next to fucking Jerry Briscoe. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know why this was going on, even though a lot of people in New York were smart to the business. It was a puzzlement to them as to why that these enemies on the program were hugging and kissing and doing whatever the fuck they were doing. And that's why all the agents got hot. That's why Jerry Briscoe threw his fucking briefcase bag down the hall and while we all just turned around and discussed and wanted to leave the building as quick as possible because we knew Vince wasn't going to fire him and that's what everybody wanted and because they shit on his dining room table in Madison Square Garden 
but the crowd didn't go ballistic. They were confused. And at least they had Ric Flair saying, hey, in the 70s, all four of those guys would come back and got shit beat out of them. And that's what everybody wanted to do, but they didn't want to get fired, and they knew Vince probably would because Sean was involved. So Sean said they weren't shitting on the business. They were expressing their friendship. And at that point, I wrote, is this where the Young Bucks get their brand of drivel? It's not exposing the business as long as you're expressing your friendship. So anyway, Triple H at that point had to start over. Hall and Nash were gone. Sean was the champion. Vince wasn't going to fucking discipline him or he'd have done it already after any uh, one of innumerable incidents. So they penalized Helmsley. He had to apologize to the locker room, which he should have. And later on, we found out he didn't mean it. And they beat him like a drum until finally he got another chance and got China. And the, here's a quote. The emergence of China was something no one had ever seen. Why did they have to lay her on so thick? What's your problem with I've, that? What do you mean? They have, like, she was revolutionary. It was Mildred Burke and women's wrestling or whatever. Well, we had never had a big roided up girl like that appear on TV for wrestling. Okay. And with the package, I'm not denying that China worked with the group as the package. She wasn't a good wrestler. She wasn't a good promo. She looked very impressive. And they, when they had her in the group, you know, it, 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 it was a great picture. Triple H in China or the group in China, Sherry and Shawn Michaels, et cetera, et cetera. But every single documentary now or every retrospective has to give you the impression that she was one of the most earth-shaking attractions in the history of professional wrestling. And that's not the case. Nobody ever bought a ticket to see China just on her own. Well, I say no, but if somebody's bought a ticket to see everything, but you know what I'm saying. As part of the group, fine. But is it because of the, they feel like they'll get points if they talk about the women's empowerment movement and how everybody got to see a strong woman? Is that why they're glorifying? Because let's not forget, they mentioned this later on in this program. As soon as they pushed this girl for two years from scratch, from nothing, from independent shows to on the biggest platform and television program in the business and in with the top group and then have her beat Jeff Jarrett on pay-per-view and put a men's title on her. And then she goes to him and says, I ought to be making the same money as Steve Austin. And they said, how about this fucking leave? She had a mental meltdown. She cracked up, believed her own publicity, just like Sable did. And just so I'm just saying they lay it on thick and the the reason why that China had a three-year career or whatever there was because she believed the laying on of the thickness and thought she should be making Steve Austin money and then cracked up further and began a different career. But, um... Well, let's be honest. Anyway. You say she cracked up there and, and her demands may have been excessive. She was a big star there. However, the cracking up may also have had to do with the fact that her longtime boyfriend was having an affair with the daughter of the owner of the company. Yes. Well, and that's another reason why you shouldn't have gone in and said, <laughs> I need Steve Austin money when you already know that your ex-boyfriend is messing around with the owner's daughter. That's probably not the thing. And by the way, you need to pay me as much as the biggest star ever in wrestling. Continuing on. Sean lost his smile. And then, of course, here comes um, the cobbler to say for the survival of the company, DX was a necessary irritant. For the survival of... For the survival... Of, now DX saved the company. Hot group, main event stars, did not save the WWF. And again, to my earlier point, and I know you can't answer this right now, if you look at 1997, look at the ratings, because that's really the best way to equate this. I guess you can look at some of the buy rates, but really it's the ratings. If you took Shawn Michaels' 
which is DX at that point, out of the equation, I don't know if it hurt WWE in terms of popularity or views. It may have hurt them in terms of stars for matches, but I don't think losing Shawn Michaels earlier, a year earlier than they did would have hurt the company. Well, and Brett uh, on this program was the only one really being honest about the way a lot of the people in the locker room felt. <laughs> you know, like with these fucking guys and their degeneracy and et cetera. But they were a, a reflection of 90s culture. So then they get to WrestleMania 98 with Tyson and uh, Austin and, and Sean dropping the belt. And they claim that Sean was self-medicating due to his bad back. He'd been self-medicating that bad back for three years before he got it. And there was... They mentioned there was drama as to whether he was going to be there or whatever, but it's all about this back injury. He was doing all kinds of shit. Remember, he stayed at another hotel. He came into town later. He was trying to tell Vince that he probably wasn't going to drop the belt. He wasn't going to show up. When he got to the building later than he was supposed to, he had to have a separate locker room. They put security outside it because he demanded it. He'd lost his fucking mind, and he was pilled to the gills. But he got in there and dropped the fucking thing the right way. And honestly, that's probably the catalyst for the, that's the, the best thing that Shawn Michaels ever did when you look at it in hindsight to boost the WWF's business was drop the belt and go home. He made Steve Austin there and then. Austin carried the ball and took him to be in a, pub a publicly traded company. Whereas Sean's run at the top was refusing to do angles, refusing to do finishes, refusing to show up, showing up in no condition to perform and lackluster ratings and buy rates. Yeah. You had Austin, you had the rock who was emerging. We talked about Mick Foley earlier, the undertaker reinvented himself and we had a brand new star with Kane show up. And there you go. So Sean's out, and here comes X-Pac, and we talked about that. And then the same night, Billy Gunn and Road Dogg joined, and that was another rib because the rockabilly gimmick was rotten, and we talked a little bit about, when we talked about Shitstain's ideas for talent, fire honky-tonk man, in 1997 he's not going to cut it. Well, no, not what they were having him do, he wasn't. It was rotten, but when... Billy became a single. They decided to put him with Honky because they thought, well, Honky can talk. He could be a manager. And the rockabilly thing, it was just silly. It was just silly. But on the other side of the coin, Road Dog Jesse James as a single babyface without Jeff Jarrett and the whole thing that they had built, that didn't make any sense either. So that was true that they were jerking the curtain, wrestling each other in the opening match. And the only person in the company that either one of them could beat was each other. But then they had, again, so much talent and personality that when they got a chance to be somewhat of themselves and do the kind of their own thing and talk a little bit, then that came out. Um, and of course, Road Dog didn't get a lot of biography, some old bullet Bob footage, which was cool. And then brief desert storm mention. And then suddenly he's Jesse James in the WWF. And, you know, here's the thing I never knew. And none of them had ever mentioned it to me that Ron and Don Harris, the Bruce brothers got Billy talked into training to wrestle. I did not know that. And they had some Bruce brothers, Smoky Mountain footage there, but I didn't know that the Bruce brothers, that the Harris boys lived in Tampa when they were starting because they worked Tennessee. I knew they moved Tampa later on, but anyway, I, the, the Harris boys and Brian Lee started in the Tennessee territory and Billy met them in Florida, but nevertheless, did you know that Brian? I don't think I had ever heard that before. I haven't seen too many shoot interviews with Billy Gunn or anything, <laughs> but the first time I ever saw him was on TV in New York on Sports Channel. They had Eddie Mansfield's IWF. The first time I ever saw Kevin Kelly, actually, as the commentator. Yeah. And the yeah. Long Riders were, uh, I forget what their names were at the time, but it was him and Bart Gunn, obviously. 
But anyway, so they they covered the uh, um, invading the Norfolk scope in the tank fitted jeep because we keep saying tank it had the big tank gun on it but it, they were actually in a jeep i don't think they could get a tank on that short notice and bischoff this time he's the one that claims that he didn't know what was going on he was in the ring doing an interview or he would have told him told him to open the door and they'd had the greatest tv of all time which is exactly what somebody on one of the programs previously i think bruce. maybe trip it was bruce said that Vince had said, if they'd have come over here, open the door, I'll have the greatest. So I don't think anybody wanted to open the door back there on that particular night. Um, and another segment on the crotch chop. And then they, they started talking at the same time, road dogs getting out of hand, as they said, and Billy Gunn's getting out of hand. Triple H wanted to be the guy. And I think he's seeing, okay, I'm in a group now. And some of the group has bad habits, and I need to, for me, uh, be a single and be the top guy. And the rest of the guys were obviously not happy with that, but he did it anyway. And, and you know, that's, again, the bad thing is, when you go back and do this biography, Road Dog had substance issues. Billy had substance issues. X Pac had substance issues. China had substance issues. The only one that didn't have substance abuse issues, alcohol, drugs, what have delusions of grandeur on wanting more money, whatever the case, was the guy that's now the most powerful person in the pro wrestling business. Funny how that turns out, isn't it? It's interesting when they showed the clip of, and it's easy to forget this, and a lot of us would like to, of Road Dogg and Billy Gunn and TNA as the Voodoo Kin Mafia, VKM. Oh, boy. And they asked, I, I, I assume they asked Triple H about it, and he kind of just shrugged and said, look, they were on drugs. You know, he understands. <laughs> he he kind of gets it. And uh, I was surprised they used that clip, and I guess you kind of had to to tell the full story. Yeah, and and I was there during that time, and God, that was so bad. And... You know, in hindsight, this may have been something I blame Shitstain for that may have been their fault because they were on drugs, so they were approximating his normal booking philosophies. People on drugs generally understand Shitstain's booking, but I blamed him for the VKM, the, the Voodoo Ken Mafia, because that, that sounded like something was so stupid and so petty. And he loved it. Now, don't get me wrong, when he would read the format, and then here comes Voodoo Ken Mafia. He had a big grin on his face. But I guess maybe it was their idea all along. So, it was just so bad. And, and that that's one thing I talked to Jeff about and couldn't get changed. Because I said, it just makes them look bad and makes the company look bad. And he said, ah, because he and Road Dog were close. Yeah, but uh, the Voodoo Ken Mafia, VKM, Vincent Kennedy McMahon. So they start burying everybody on TV, and and everybody's in a bad place with drugs. There's no re needs, reason, need or reason to go into detail on everybody's sadness. But everybody went to rehab, and everybody's family came back, except for China. And Road Dog went back to the writing team because Triple H pulled for him. And finally, Sean, of all people, because it, but I loved this anecdote because I didn't know he was there then. And I assume, I unless they're lying, he was. But the night in, what was it, Panama City, Florida, that Vince buys WCW and shows up on Monday Nitro, Sean had walked in that night to visit. No, the Road Dog. Was it Road Dog? I thought it was Sean. No, it was Road Dog. I thought it was Sean. Who got arrested that night? I thought Triple H and Sean had an argument. Maybe it was Triple H and Road Dog. Yeah, Road Dog did get arrested that night. Well, I get whatever the fuck. They still had all kinds of problems. And then finally, Sean straightened up for his kid and called Triple H and came back. And then they, they you know, buttoned the thing up at the end. At Raw 1000, everybody reunites except China. But then China's mother said she talked to her in Japan for the first time in 27 years, and then China comes back to California and dies. And then everybody else gets inducted in the Hall of Fame. 
But, uh, you know, you think about it, um, a lot of those guys wasted a number of years that they could have still been on top and been productive, and I'm I'm assuming they all know that. It's not like nobody's pointed it out to them before. But uh, while I think everybody in that group, except for, I'm not going to fucking lie and say I didn't think China was that good, but everybody else in the group had talent, but Triple H is the only one that managed to actually start at the bottom, work his way to the top, never fall from grace, never fucking have issues, never have to go to rehab, worked his ass off, politicked his ass off, and is now the most powerful man in the world of wrestling. And everybody else is kind of like the, you know, the the guy that was once in that famed vaudeville group. What do you think of this show? I guess that's a way to look at it. The guy in the fame. It's kind of like Triple H is Teddy Pendergrass. And the rest of the guys <laughs> are Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Harold Notes. Melvin and the Blue Notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of more like that. Um, you know, I actually liked a lot of this documentary. I like kind of getting everyone's backstory. It was nice. Um you know, I think Sean Waltman is just so refreshing whenever you see him talking in any of these things out of anyone in wrestling, especially anyone who's gone through stuff. He's got his head on his shoulders. He's got perspective. I think he's just so good and so real in all of these things. It's interesting just watching everything play out now, knowing where we are today and watching 25 years ago, a young Triple H with that head of hair and remembering what I thought of him at the time. And then you see him a few years later when he got all bulked up and they never, they never bring that up in any of these things. Just how all of a sudden he got to be double the size as bodybuilder Paul Levesque. But it's just really interesting to watch kind of the, kind of seeing Triple H honestly talk about what he wanted out of wrestling at that time. And, you know, even them talking about the breakup of DX because he just didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And how it pissed off the other guys. That's kind of like a... Yeah, I'm going to keep comparing this to other things. When the Go-Go's broke up, and, you know, they're like, what do you mean? You have no right to fucking leave the band. You know, it's kind of like that. Everyone's relying on that one person. Not relying, I shouldn't say that, but he was certainly the biggest star in DX. I think Jane Weedland could have just jumped right in and picked right up the, the, the baton and carried it. Well, she was the first one to leave, and remember, she was also one of the prime songwriters, so it caused a lot of dissension in the band because not only did she quit the band, but also she was getting more money than just about every other member because she wrote the song. So there was a lot of problems with the band. Yeah, but Belinda Carlisle was a camera hog. Well, speaking of members who got more money than the other members, Triple H, of course, doing very well for himself now. <laughs> but, you know, the other thing is you bring up how when you see the old footage and you're not wrong, everything is so big and everyone just seems like such big stars and the crowds are going crazy. And that's true. But a lot of the stuff... You know, I'm not going to say it doesn't hold up, but some of the stuff you see from back then, you kind of cringe a little more than you would have back then. Oh, I cringed back then. If it wasn't something that would have fit on a wrestling program, regardless of the time period, I always cringe because I hate when you constantly make a habit of trying to copy or imitate pop culture, then you just limit yourself because pop culture shit's only hot for a little while, whereas you make a wrestling star, he's hot forever. I don't like to date. I don't mean date in a romantic way, going out to a movie. I don't, I don't like to date people with gimmicks that are tied to specific pop culture any more than necessary because then you've got a short-term deal going on, unless it's supposed to be a short-term deal to begin with. Hey, on that topic, let me ask you one quick question before we move on. Magnum T.A., Yes. Do you think he successfully got it so that people thought of him without thinking of Magnum P.I.? Yes, actually, I do. Because I was in the middle of a lot of those people thinking that. And, and, and also, Magnum P.I., it wasn't like that wasn't the first year of that show. The show came out right. a few years before yeah. Magnum T.A., so it wasn't like the thing that was on everybody's tongue. And the only reason he took that name was because he had kind of the Tom Selleck-ish mustache and the rugged good looks 
So it was kind of an homage more than a, I mean, you know, Tom Selleck was uh, quite a bit different in personality on the television show than Magnum T.A. portrayed in wrestling, but it was the the mustache and the general beefcake idea of things. Yeah, Tom Selleck smiled every now and then. They were very different. Every once in a while, yes, which was very different from <laughs> And Magna, he smiled in the locker room, but it just, he was very serious when he went out. Uh... But anyway, so that was the biography on DX. And again, you know, they had a lot of personal issues. Every And everybody in the group, except for Triple H. And that is a natural segue to another of our fine sponsors that I'm not even going to make fun of in this instance, because some people out there maybe having the same kind of issues or issues in general that they need help with or somebody to talk to. And I think somebody on that program, and I'm trying to think of who it was, probably X-Pac, I think, Sean Waltman, said you can't, because he is grounded and probably has the best head on his shoulders, said you can't make somebody do something unless they decide they want to, you can't make somebody help themselves unless they're going to do it. You're the person that's got to help yourself, but you can get assistance in facilitating that. If you've made the decision that something's bothering you, something's preventing your happiness or hampering your ability to lead a, the life you want to lead and you need to talk to somebody about it, that's our friends at BetterHelp. Because BetterHelp is online therapy. They've got video sessions, phone sessions, live chat only therapy sessions. You don't have to go on camera. You don't have to go anywhere in person, but you can connect with somebody and be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And it's more affordable than traditional in person therapy. And this is not just for substance abuse or issues of that nature, but for anything that's bothering you and hampering you, they can obviously talk to you about it and or make suggestions of other places to go and things to do. But right now, if you do go to BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com, slash J-C-E, our listeners are going to get 10% off their first month's services. BetterHelp.com, slash J-C-E, 10% off your first month's services to help you take better care of your mind. You know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And I've already probably wasted half of mine as it is watching wrestling over the years, so I'm keeping careful track of the other half. What about you, Brian? Where's your brain these days? I was going to say, I think I lost half of it this week watching wrestling, let alone half my life. 